really Sorry. Uh, because sometimes I think there's an unrealistic expectation of, oh, we connect with the institution and then we'll see some outcomes within six months. And as I was kind of telling uh, Maureen and Michelle before that you all have known each other a long time, you have kind of engaged in this work um, in the past and then more recently with the, um, with the grant, like you have kind of, you know, put the work into overdrive uh, a bit. So again, thank you all for um, joining and sharing your insights on um, what these relationships look like and more importantly, the work that you're trying to do uh, to support um, students from HBCUs and providing them access to not only resources, but access to graduate and professional education, broadly speaking. I uh, want to acknowledge and thank Maureen. Um, she does incredible work in helping to manage all of this stuff in terms of schedules and, and getting information out. I don't make her job easy, uh, so I really appreciate her, appreciate for all that she does. Uh, Michelle is a, a graduate student and working with us here um, this year. Uh, and she'll be helping to co-facilitate some of these um, workshops moving forward. And today she's kind of um, serving in an observing capacity. Uh, but uh, my approach to work is engaging graduate students to whatever extent they want to engage in, um, in this type of, of work. Um, folks, mics will be muted um, throughout the conversation just so that you all can engage and have this kind of conversation and dialogue across. I provided some of the prompts ahead of time, but uh, I have them in front of me and we'll ask some of the questions to kick you all off. Um, we also have closed caption available, so you can you can um, check into that as well. And then uh, lastly, we use the um, the IGR community guidelines for how we kind of engage in these online formats. And it's just a, a reminder of, you know, just to be cordial in our engagement. Um, think about intent versus impact. This is more so for um, those who are um, participants in this work. Um, ensuring that we're you know sharing airtime and all of that um, fun stuff um, with that, and then just so for a quick overview for folks who are here and may not um, necessarily be familiar, the MSI initiative here um, at the University of Michigan um, began officially in 2017 with um, my position of minority serve institutions coordinator, but the work actually started before beforehand um, as well. Thinking about how we can better engage uh, minority serving institutions as a way of creating opportunities um, for traditionally uh, and histor historically marginalized student populations. Um, and another part of that is that we have state, eleven, state level affirmative action bans. And this um, work still allows for us to engage with um, uh, certain student populations um, in a um, um, university state compliant manner, right? And so uh, and coming in 2017, um, uh, we developed a grant initiative to provide seed funding to folks such as yourselves in order to um, support the outreach, the planning, the engagement, and even large scale collaborative activities between minority serving institutions and graduate and professional programs here at Rackham. And part of the idea behind that is what we see with our peer and competitor institutions, we see this engagement happening all the time. Um, this cross pollinization of, you know, it's, you know, a faculty member who graduated from the University of Minnesota. Uh, so he sends his students there and then when they graduate, they come back to Michigan and get jobs. And we see that that sort of happening and, and that's centered within faculty collaboration, right? So that's one part of it. We want to, wanted to foster deeper faculty engagement and collaboration across institutions encouraging them to bring students into the fall as a means of strengthening these pathways for um, their students. And then also we think about this from uh, another perspective of like networked improvement community, um, communities. And this is a framework developed by Carnegie Foundation, which centers around addressing common problems, but using collective uh, approaches and impact, right? So how do we take what political science is doing both at Jackson State and at Michigan? And how do we take what, um, you know, uh, molecular cellular developmental biology, what they're doing here at Michigan and with their partner institutions and think, what are the core issues that we're trying to address and how do we eliminate those so that we can, again, strengthen pathways and opportunities for um, students from marginalized uh, backgrounds. So 
that's kind of why we're here. And as a part of that grant, we um, uh, we asked for those who have received grants to, to talk about their work. Um, and this is not um, to, uh, I guess, fulfill or uh, feed egos uh, because you all don't need that. You all are talented faculty members, but it's more so um, a result of me going through the discovery phase and trying to learn about relationships that exist like this outside of Michigan. There's just not a lot of information out there. So the purpose that um, or gap we're trying to fill with these um, coffee chat series is to create a knowledge base for people to tap into and learn from as they develop their relationships moving forward. Uh, forward. Um, um, uh, in addition to sharing best, best practices within and across institutions and highlighting exemplars um, from um, University of Michigan and across the country so that we can think about how we strengthen these relationships and better support these students as they transition from Jackson State into the University of Michigan for graduate and professional education. Um, so with that, uh, we have uh, Rob Mickey, um, who is an associate professor here and director of graduate studies in the Department of Political Science um, here at the University of Michigan. Um, his research centers around um, politics and historical and comparative, um, comparative um, perspective. And he is uh, interested and looks at uh, America's uh, democratization and contemporary de uh, democratic stability, racial conflict and the intersection of uh, long-term political and economic development. Um, uh, Brian DeAndre Ore uh, is a, a professor of political science at um, Jackson State. Um, he is well published, uh, and you've seen his work, in, you know, in American politics, uh, politics research, twin research in human genetics, um, policy quarterly. You've seen his commentary on uh, Al Jazeera, MSNBC, CNN, uh, the News Hour with PBS, uh, and the list goes on. He also served as a director of um, Jackson State's Political Science Research Laboratory. And through that, he established a pipeline for students of color um, entering PhD programs. So um, over the past decade or so, uh, nearly 20 of his former research assistants have gone into um, PhD programs across the country. So he is not new to this work. Um, so hopefully um, we will be able to um, uh, tap into his experiences as well. So thank you both for joining us here uh, this afternoon. So with that, I provided you all a couple of prompts uh, in advance and I have them here. So I'll start with, with the first one, uh, which is centered around the nature of the relationship between the political science departments at Jackson State and University of Michigan and what type of activities are you all engaging in? Uh, Brian, uh, uh, Rob, you want to take first stab at that? Um, sure. So um, I guess I'll just start by saying there's, given COVID, there are the, there are the uh, activities we plan to do, and then there's the ones we're actually doing. Um, so the goal of this, this collaboration um, is, well, there are lots of goals, right? So one is um, to... Uh, encourage more undergrads at Jackson State to consider um, graduate study in political science. There are lots of ways, and we'll talk about that, um, how we uh, try to get them interested, um, but also to, um, to develop kind of research collaborations uh, with uh, faculty across the two departments. Um, and then finally, uh, given all of Mich Michigan's resources and the fact that Jackson State's faculty, you know, have like, I don't know what, DeAndre, triple the teaching load that we have here in Michigan, right? Um, we have a lot more resources and in, including time. And so um, one thing that we've uh, wanted to work on from the beginning is figure out ways that, that Michigan can share some of its resources, whether it's financial, logistical, human, whatever, to um, help, uh, help kind of spur professional development of these overworked faculty at Jackson State in ways that they're interested in doing. So um, that's kind of the overview. DeAndre, do you want to give them the COVID See, reality going. or anything? Or? I'll, I'll give you an example, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of 
the dearth of resources. Um, there was an occasion where I needed a data set and we're not a part of the ICPSR and the Consortium for Social Political Research. Um, and so I contacted Rob and because Michigan is, you know, a member <laughs> and it is housed at Michigan, uh, Rob was able to get those data for me. And so that, you know, that's, that sounds small, but it was a, an extremely important data set. Um, we're trying to look at work that intersects psychology and, and political science. And so that was, uh, that was very helpful. Um, <clears throat> in terms of collaborations, we haven't, we haven't gotten an opportunity to collaborate as much, but <clears throat> I, I have been able to um, have them on speed dial. Excuse me. <clears throat> so we're working on a problem uh, on a project now, where we're looking at the unique um, ways in which people participate in politics. And so since Rob's work was on the South, um, we were interested in, you know, how a place like Georgia uh, was able to elect, you know, black senator and Mississippi has 40%, you know, 32% voting age population higher than, than Georgia and we're not close. Uh, so, you know, given the fact that he had done case studies on Georgia and Mississippi, uh, that gave us a perspective or enhanced our perspective rather in terms of what we were trying to do. And so we could justify choosing those cases. So that's an example. And then Vince Hutchings and all of this is we're actually applying for a National Science Foundation grant as I speak. Uh, and so Vince Hutchings expertise is in survey design and we're looking to create a survey uh, that will speak to the unique political and um, psychological attitudes of, of African Americans. So this is just one case, or the, this is just one project rather, that it's not like we're producing a, um, a manuscript, but but no, let me back up. That is the case. We, we're, we're actually applying for a National Science Foundation grant and Vince will be a PI on it, so. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why Michigan and Jackson State were um, and are a good match is that intellectually, there's a lot of common interest in the faculty. Um, uh, Michigan's department has long been strong in not just studying racial politics, but from a social psychological perspective. And that's not work that I really do or even understand all that well, but it is exactly the work that DeAndre has done. And, you know, I think I'd like to hear DeAndre talk more about this, but um, Jackson State's small, right? It's how many undergrads y'all have? Well, we, we, don't, we only have about 65 majors. Per year or total or? Yeah, yeah, political science, yeah. Yeah, we graduate like 375 <laughs> poli sci majors a year. <laughs> um, but so one of the remarkable things about what DeAndre has done over the years is send so many students to top graduate programs, including ours. Um, and one woman, um, Edmund, you know, Princess Williams, who's this September is going to star as a professor at Amherst College, which is, which I don't think she ever imagined doing like six or seven years ago. Totally awesome. Um, a lot of, I think a lot of DeAndre's success in producing so many, sending so many people, not just to begin, but to finish graduate school and to pursue these careers was the fact that um, DeAndre had gotten NSF funding to set up this lab, um, this kind of social psych and race politics lab that allowed him to um, recruit undergrads and you paid him, right, to work as research assistants yeah. and to kind of shift from thinking like, if I graduate, I guess I'll go to law school to, hey, there's this weird thing that Professor Ori does, maybe I should look into that, right? 
and that 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 thing is key just that being able to introduce students to new career paths through mm-hmm. paid work not unpaid work mm-hmm. right but paid work um, as research assistants um, and so um, one of the things that we're trying to build on um, and this was kind of work kind of didn't last summer last summer under COVID, with covid um, there are actually three Jackson State students accepted to Michigan's SROP, the Summer Research Opportunity Program, where students are paid um, decent money, right? It's like 5,000 bucks for, I think it's decent money, 5,000 bucks for eight weeks, room and board. And they, they're supposed to come here, work on a research project with a faculty member, take courses about the GRE and meet with our grad students to talk about whether they want to go to grad school and everything. And so we got three from Jackson State, which was great, but wasn't so great because it was tough to, you know, it was tough to introduce them to the possibilities of grad school when we were doing this online, when one of them contracted COVID over the summer, right? I mean, it was, yeah. So, um, but one of the, I'll, I'll, sorry, I, I had too much caffeine. I'll stop in a second. But mm-hmm. one of the students who participated on uh, virtually last year, Chelsea Waddell, working with Vince on one of his projects, is going to come back, hopefully in person. I don't know. Maybe in person this year, maybe partly in person. I think they're still waiting on, on uh, that determination. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, anyhow. Sorry, go ahead. No, I think another... Um, benefit or outcome from last summer we had a faculty member to take an icpsr course and that's extremely important because you know hey deandre uh, tell them what that is I uh, okay so the icpsr program in the consortium political social research is right i think so yeah. and it's housed in michigan and it's a um summer stat camp if you will so there are all these statistics courses that are you know based in or rooted in the social sciences in terms of the way that they teach the courses and we had one professor who took one of those courses uh, and that's extremely important because one of the reasons that we send our students to summer programs or encourage them to apply is that we just have a dearth of human resources and so we don't have even myself you know we just don't have the the, the, the personnel to teach some of these method, method, method courses and methods is extremely important in almost any graduate program. So for her to have been able to get this professional development, uh, it actually helps the student indirectly because now she can teach those courses. Yeah, I think that's uh, a great point, right? So as I kind of hear you all talk, I hear uh, like many modalities of of uh, engagement within the relation within a relationship. So there's this uh, building capacity across institutions for both faculty members at Michigan and, and also at, at uh, Jackson State. So in the case of Jackson State, there's some professional development opportunities where they come in and get some additional uh, training to strengthen um, their skill sets. There's some uh, opportunities to get access to things that uh, perhaps Jackson State does, doesn't have access to no, at, at no fault of Jackson State. It's just these um, these in, uh, disparities in um, you know sort of exist. So we see leverage. You, you know, you all leverage the relationships in, in that way. But then also for um, as I'm hearing for like Rob and the folks at Michigan, they're learning uh, how to better engage around supporting students to both prepare them and support them while they're here uh, on campus. Um, through through these um, research activities, right? So with the those sort of activities, um, and and I'll take a question and frame it in this way intentionally. So what what's your motivation, like individually, uh, for wanting to pursue, pursue these relationships across institutions? So individually, you know, what's the motivation, and then also what's the motivation for your respective departments to to engage um, um, and collaborate in in this way? So I'll start, I'll start individually. It's just, um, I need help. <laughs> so I'm screaming help if I, had to, if I had to sign, I'd hold up help. 
So um, I mean, it's hard, man. You know, you teach three, four classes, and you know, you have to create exams, you have to grade exams, you have to write these proposals, and and so it's good to be able to reach out to colleagues to get feedback on your work. And that's extremely important, you know, for folks who are um, experts in their respective areas. Um, so for me, you know, my selfish reason is to be able to, you know, get feedback, um, potentially collaborate, um, and then, you know, in this particular case that we're working now with the National Science Foundation proposal, um, you know, be funded to to create new knowledge. I mean, we're, we're talking about doing a survey and, you know, going to places where like rural areas versus urban areas to see if there are these differences in the way that Black people think. And, and then we, you know, create questions that can be put on surveys. So doing a deeper dive than what currently exists. And, you know, the, the team at, at Michigan or the, or the department at Michigan, they're the right people to help do this. So, you know, those are the type, you know, things I was, you know, I was gonna apply for the grant, but it's a perfect fit because of this program. We already have established this relationship, you know, beyond the personal relationship, I've been knowing these guys over 20 years, but, you know, this is develop a professional and institutional relationship. Rob. Um, so individual motivation, I mean, I guess mine has just been to desegregate my work life, um, desegregate, try to help desegregate political science as a discipline. And then when I became director of graduate studies, I mean, my focus wasn't, I wasn't really thinking about um, um, focusing totally on, on diversifying graduate education. But when I was given this role, voluntold to have this role by my chair, right? Um, then I see a call for proposals from you. I never, never would have thought of this on my own, right? But it was just seeing that call for proposals that got this started. But yeah, just individually, I, I mean, like like DeAndre alluded to, I I got to know him. I'm embarrassed to say, yeah, two decades ago, when I was doing field work in Jackson um, and doing research on on Southern racial politics and political history, and uh, yeah, so I mean, I've always had a mo my motives have always been around around uh, democracy and racial politics, but um, it was Rackham making these, these opportunities available um, that led, led me to want to tackle this. I would say institutionally, you know, our, our department just finished its 10th year of, of an emerging scholars program where we bring, well, we used, hopefully will again soon, physically bring 12, junior or seniors and undergrad plus their advisors so they're not traveling to some scary place all alone and they're usually students who are getting started on a senior honors thesis or something and there's a conference where and it is kind of scary they're sitting in a they're presenting in the front of a room and the whole audience is michigan faculty and phd students and they're kind of pitching their ideas as a 20 year old or whatever for their uh, undergrad research. And um, when we first started that, again, we got the idea from, from uh, Rackham. Um, DeAndre was one of the, um, the first people we reached out to to say, wait, how do we do this? How do we do this in an effective way? Can you, send, can you bring yourself and your students up? Um, so he was kind of, DeAndre was present from the start in our, at least over the last 10 years, in our working a lot harder on diversifying graduate education. I mean, I will say that Michigan has long been the leader in producing um, doctorates of color among all the top 
PhD programs in political science, but you know, that's relative to not, you know, I think something like 29% of our PhDs since 1995 have been from underrepresented groups. Um, um, again, way better than other top departments, but still nothing to like pat yourself on the back for. But one of the reasons why we've been really good at recruiting students is because, um, especially in the case with of African-American and Hispanic students, we've always had faculty working on those areas. Um, but it's easier for us to recruit faculty because we have these brilliant graduate students interested in working with them. So those things have really grown together. Um, so that's the kind of department's longer history. But um, yeah, for me, once this opportunity arose, it was kind of obvious uh, whom to reach out to. Very good, thank you for that. Um, and I appreciate um, both of those perspectives, right? Um, and again, this is one of the goals for having some of these conversations or, or this work at large. So one of my biggest concerns uh, is that um, and working to establish these relationships that it is is one sided, right? So uh, we we've been very intentional around crafting everything that we do to ensure that what's done with at the program and department lo level is mutually beneficial and bi directional. And I'm, I'm hearing that from both of you, right? So again, Rob, you're able to learn from the work that that DeAndre has done over the years and, and helping to support and develop his students and getting them into spaces. But then conversely, again, DeAndre um, at Jackson State is getting the support that he needs in a way that is both meaningful and relevant to, to him. So I think there's that is in line with what we're hoping to see, right? So with that, um, as this relationship continues to develop, and again, it becomes, um, I mean, it's not necessarily formal, but becomes more formalized through mechanisms such as this grant, through the grant that um, through NSF, what are some of the, the um, ultimate goals uh, of a relationship like this? And then the benefits, not just for um, your department, but what, what are the larger uh, implications for such a relationship for the field at large and beyond? Yeah, so I think that, you know, the work that we're trying to do here um, now, which is the intersection of mental health and political participation, um, I think that it's, it's sort of novel. Um, we've been looking at research in psychology that looks at cumulative trauma, and they look at, you know, something like 9-11, the Boston bombings, and, you know, people who um, who are exposed, whether it be by the media indirectly or, or directly, whether or not, you know, future trauma can be mitigated by those past, you know, experiences. But what they do not do in the literature and psychology is that they don't make, make considerations for the unique trauma that Blacks experience, such as uh, police shootings or whatnot. And so we've, we've, we've been able to work with um, another university, Arkansas, to put those questions on, on the survey. Um, and then <clears throat> trying to bridge it or intersect it with political science, we started looking at, you know, political participation, you know, when individuals who are, ex are exposed to these various forms of trauma, whether it be, you know, COVID-19, whether it be police shootings, you know, does that impact one participating in politics? And so the preliminary results suggest that it does, that, you know, Blacks who um, are exposed to media related to police shootings uh, are more likely to participate in politics. Now, what we've been talking about, the uh, thing I mentioned before with Rob is, you know, how do, it, 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 currently Georgia, any discussion with respect to, you know, a, a successful model for black mobilization, political mobilization, it's Stacey Abrams. <laughs> it's like, you know, just bring Stacey Abrams in and, you know, we can, you know, make a change. And so we, we, we know that's not true <laughs> because I live in Mississippi. 
I know it's not true, at least for Mississippi, but, but that's the point. What is the difference between Georgia and the difference between Mississippi? And so Rob has written about this, uh, this difference. And so even though, you know, his work is not in behavior, um, it has this historical context that we definitely need. Uh, and, and, and that was because of the relationship that we have. You know, I wouldn't have known of his work probably uh, had I not known him. And that allowed me to, uh, you know, bounce questions off of him to help inform, you know, the work that we're doing now. And the, and the same thing with Vince. Vince, you know, was um, working with the National Election Study. The National Election Study is the largest uh, study for presidential elections. Um, and it's housed at the, uh, in the Consortium for Political Social Research. But Vince actually was on that board and uh, a co-PI. So it's ideal to have him on this grant because, you know, he can give us the advice we need in terms of trying to, um, trying to develop original uh, concepts. One of, I just add one of the things that's been frustrating about COVID is, is I think we all know, you know, a lot of the benefits from conferences or workshops or whatever in person aren't necessarily the things that happen during the official panels, but it's the, the stray conversations at the coffee breaks and so on. Um, I learned a lot of stuff I didn't know and commonalities that our department has with Jackson State just because DeAndre and a colleague came up for the, the, the kickoff event that you had, when was that, October 19, 2019? Seems like a long time ago at this point, yeah. <laughs> Is that when, yeah, I think that's when it was, right? yeah. And so, you know, one of the things we were going to do last summer, Vince has, uh, sorry, Vince, um, DeAndre has all this research that he's done but hasn't published yet, and it's just, again, not by coincidence, but Michigan's real strength, it's not me, but we have like six or seven faculty who are focused on exactly what DeAndre does, which is this intersection of social psychology um, and racial politics. And we were thinking of having him up here for a couple of weeks. I think we even had that in the budget, right? Um, to workshop his unpublished papers to get feedback but for me, the real benefit of that, selfishly, wasn't just that DeAndre would then get feedback and that would maybe help him publish some of that, but it would just be having him here and realizing that, oh, Jackson State, other faculty, Jackson State and DeAndre have like seven other research collaborations or just even seeds of an idea that are exactly along the lines of thinking of things that we would like to do, but haven't figured out how to do yet. So I think just finally getting the damn vaccine and meeting in person, um, I'm thinking long-term, there's a lot that we can uh, build to kind of build um, these kind of intellectual collaborations, not just with faculty, but between undergraduates and graduates at the two schools. One of the things that we're gonna do in the, I think winter semester 2022, is um, uh, teach a class, a three-way class on racial politics over Zoom with Jackson State for undergrad, for Jackson State, Michigan, and the University of Puerto Rico. Um, again, as a way, and it's, is it a benefit if there are two other new voice, faculty voices for Jackson State students? Maybe, not sure if mine's one of them, it's a benefit. But certainly it's a big benefit for students and faculty at Puerto Rico and in Michigan um, to hear from their undergrads for have, having undergrads working together on research projects together and so on. So, um, you know, ideally we're thinking beyond just the grant stuff that DeAndre is talking about um, and not just research collaborations, but even, even undergraduate teaching. Um, so that's something we're excited about building. And again, so, sorry, one more thing. That maybe the only benefit of COVID is that we've learned that, hey, we can actually teach um, 
across space like this and it doesn't really cost anything. And again, we, we wouldn't have thought of that without Zoom. Absolutely, which is a, a, a great piece, right? So how do we, I mean, these are, the students at these institutions are future collaborators, right? So how do we um, begin to uh, develop that culture of collaboration at that stage? All right, because in graduate education, sometimes there can be feelings of um, like hyper comp competition, so on and so <laughs> forth, right? But uh, begin to um, prepare them for that at an earlier stage with access to colleagues and faculty members across um, institutions. I think that makes sense. Um, I have a couple minutes left here. Uh, so I always like to, you know, end these types of things with um, practical, you know, takeaways, right? So from both of your perspectives, so Rob, from your perspective in Michigan, and DeAndre, your perspective at Jackson State, um, what are one or two takeaways from your respective experiences that um, you would share to others who are thinking about developing out similar relationships? So what are some things that they should think about? What should they be planning for? What did, you know, should they consider that perhaps you didn't consider who should they bring to the table that you know um, you hadn't thought about? What are some challenges they may experience? But one or two takeaways each. Jay, you go first. <laughs> so, you know, when you do fundraising, they said first you have to friend raise, <laughs> and so I think that you have to develop, you know, um, rapports with colleagues from you know across. The country, but if you plan to uh, establish a collaboration with the university, uh, you definitely need to, um, you know, develop a a, um, a relationship. So I think relationships are probably the most important because it is the nucleus. Uh, we can have this program on paper, but not implement, you know, what we put together. But because of the relationship. Um, that we have, it does help to um, ensure that you know we, we have something to take away from it. Um, also, students are a lot more um, beneficial. They can be more more beneficial than 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 we tend to believe sometimes. So, you know. Um, Vince has a, a, a research lab where he has these meetings weekly. Well, I'll try to collect the data, code the data, <laughs> write up the report, and the students are sitting there waiting for something to do. And so I've learned, you know, just from observing uh, Vince, and we both have a common um, undergrad assistant in Chelsea uh, that, you know, just give these students the opportunity and let them go with it. And it's actually been a relief for me in taking some of that um, load off of my plate by just having the cold data, for example. Um, so, you know, I'd say it's student-centered, you know, cliche-ish, but, you know, in reality, they are an asset and we should, um, you know, Look at look at them as such. Very good. Thank you for that, Rob. Yeah, and that's and that's the way that they can find out what it is that we do on the research side, whether they want to pursue a career in that. That's right. I, mean, I guess I'd say one lesson is be patient. Don't expect that um, you know you start a relationship and then the next year they're going to be five undergrad from that school joining the your graduate program you know we had three students who were involved from Jackson State last summer and you know one um one's maybe interested in thinking more about political science one student was like okay now I see what you mean I guess I'll go to law school anyhow which I totally <laughs> respect right so we're just you got to be patient because you're introducing students to the possibility of maybe a career path they haven't considered before, but you're not going to have immediate huge numbers, right? The other thing I learned is that um, you can't build these relationships um, to last if they just involve 
one person at each institution, especially um, one person at uh, at the under resourced place, right? Where there's so much burden on them to do everything, and that's you know that's that's a challenge that I mean we'll have. I think continue to have just because Jackson State, how many faculty do y'all have? Um, seven now. And we have 55, right? So if, you know, if I have to do something else or I don't know something like we can find somebody to help out, right? But um, yeah, it's uh, everybody's busy. Everybody was busy before we started these relationships. So you're kind of asking people to find time that they they don't have, right? Um, but yeah, that goes double for the burden that uh, DeAndre has. So um, it's it's hard to do, but try to, um, my advice would be try to think from the beginning about a team of people who can support each other so that um, not everything's landing on one person's shoulders. Very good. That is uh, sound uh, advice. Uh, and I'll just summarize that uh, for folks that are here, at least as I heard it or uh, am in interpreting, right? Uh, I think, uh, uh, DeAndre, the idea of relationship and rapport building is key. And again, that's one of the uh, cornerstones upon which the the funding from Rackham is built to just kind of spend some time getting to know one another. Uh, and if you know each other, uh, spend some time um, fleshing that relationship out even further. Encourage other folks to join in um, and just kind of build that uh, rapport across institutions. So I think that is um, fantastic. Uh, Rob, the idea of, of being patient, we talk about this all the time, right? And, you know, sometimes we look towards the, the, um, the ideal outcome, which mean you know, ideal outcome being uh, students in graduate programs. But the reality is that there, there are bottlenecks that exist and these, these programs don't exist or these relationships don't exist in a vacuum, uh, but they exist in programs and departments that have structures and politics and things of that nature uh, in which these sorts of initiatives have to function within and getting other others on board to do this uh, work or think uh, the way that you do could can be challenging. So we have to think about what success looks like in many different ways. How many students are we given summer research opportunities um, to how are we collaborating on grants papers? How are we um, supporting the students throughout their journey? So I think be patient is key. Uh, the team-based approach is something that I, I highly uh, advocate for, uh, both for capacity building, but also um, for um, uh, scalability and sustain uh, sustainability. For this work to sustain, you know, the more folks that you kind of bring in uh, and have ownership over this work, uh, the more leverage you have in moving forward. And then, DeAndre, I want to let leave on the um, the last point, uh, in the last point on which you made in terms of the using students and I don't use I don't mean that in a negative sense uh, but students uh, benefit from opportunity right and so as the you know graduate programs one of the things that folks tend to look at is prior research experience right and so as a faculty member the work that you have going on uh, there's that's an easy way for folks to think about how do we provide a student with more research experience like so how can we in many ways, formalize some of those informal engagements. And I know that you all are doing that in, in some way. So again, I appreciate you all, one, for being the first to do this. Uh, I really appreciated it kind of. <laughs> uh, Rob, I told him that uh, a week or two ago and he said, what, you put me on first? <laughs> uh, but I, I do appreciate it. Um, uh, I really value uh, engaging with Rob as he, uh, he helps open my mind and, and thinking about these and then DeAndre as well, um, you know, just kind of meeting and knowing you over the past two years or so um, and just engaging with you. Uh, I leave so much more better than uh, before. Uh, so I thank you both for um, for um, sharing your insights on how your relationship is is um, developing and um, hope, you know, potential implications for the future. Um, with that, we have a couple people on the call. I'll open the floor for for them to see if there are some questions that they may have. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. <laughs>